All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I just came out here. I got like a wave of dizziness. I must be more nervous than I thought. So dizziness, go away in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to have you all here today. I'm so happy to be speaking with you today. And we are in this series, as you just saw, of emotions and how to deal with our emotions. And I have been looking forward to this series coming up <clears throat> because I really strongly believe that it is so important for us as a church to talk about these things. And if you have not yet had a chance to hear Pastor Jim's message, um, well, two messages actually, um, but specifically even last week's about anger specifically, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. Even if you're a person and you don't feel like you're currently struggling with feelings of anger, I still encourage you to go back and listen to it. And even the one before, which was on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, there's just so much that we can pull out of this, and it's so important as a church to biblically align what God says about our emotions. And today we're talking about sadness, and that's a topic that isn't entirely always easy to talk about. It's not like we woke up this morning on this nice, thank God, bright day and said, let's go talk about sadness. You know, like that's not exactly what we sign up for. However, when we talk about our emotions, especially something like sadness in the presence of the Lord, it is the safest place to talk about things like sadness. And, you know, Pastor Jim said last week, and this is so true, God gave us our emotions. God gave us our emotions. Can we say that out loud, actually? God gave us our emotions. And that is a true sentence. But isn't it funny how in our culture, both our American culture, and I love being American, but in our American culture, but also our church culture, and I don't mean just ours, I mean church at large, we can act like that sentence is not true. And in doing so, we're not living in the health that God wants us to be living in. This is in your notes if you were able to grab them. Sadness is a primary emotion, meaning it is innate and shared by everyone across culture. Say everyone. Everyone. What does that mean? That means if I saw an individual that I was from another side of the world and they had a totally different language than I um, and we had no specific life experience that is similar, we might not be able to communicate very easily. But because sadness is what they call a primary emotion, it means it's felt by all cultures and all generations throughout all of history. If that person was exuding sadness, or if I was exu exuding sadness, we would be able to understand, oh, that person's sad right now. They would be able to understand about me, oh, that person's sad right now. Because it's something felt by everyone at some point in life. It might be for a brief season, it might be for a long season, but every one of us in this room, in fact, the Bible even promises it, that we will experience seasons of sadness. But isn't it funny how it's such a common thing and such a primary emotion, and yet, including myself, it's not easy to talk about, right? It's hard to kind of unpack a little bit. And that's what I want to do today. And if you're the type of person where you're like, well, I'm not really like an overly emotional person, and I'm not a touchy-feely person, and I don't cry a lot, I'm not trying to cause us all to have a big cry session and sing Kumbaya, okay? Like, I'm not trying to change how you're wired or anything like that. But what I do want to talk about today is what is our viewpoint of how God views emotion. And also when we are sad, what do we do with it? Because we're going to be sad at some point or another. Many of you might be sad in this room. And my goal is not to submerge us into sadness either. You know, Pastor Jim, and I'm so glad you did, talked about the news, what's going on even in the past 24 hours. And that's so important to do because we can't turn a blind eye to that. What's hard, and I think Pastor Ralph said this in a message recently, we, this, I'm attached to my phone as well, just like everybody else. I'm a millennial, so I don't go leave the room without it, right? But we were not meant to have every single piece of news from every single corner of the earth at our fingertips at all times, and yet here it is, right? And it doesn't mean we put our heads in the sand. It doesn't mean we lose empathy. We need to talk about what Pastor Jim just talked about. But our brains were not meant to take that in, that's God's job. He takes the weight of the world, but we just have it flown in our faces, right? So my goal today is not to submerge us deeper into something sad, but instead to say, what do we do with this? What does Jesus do when he sees that we are sad? Okay, you, you tracking with me? Um, you know, Noah's now two, so we've entered the wonderful world of toddler emotions. It's so fun. And <laughs> it's a lot to navigate. And it's actually wonderful. But a huge thing in parenting right now, and I think it's a good thing, I think it's a good trend, is that we as the parent, have to learn, and you really, you need Jesus for this. I don't know what I'm doing. If you got advice, let me know. Uh, 
<laughs> I can't preach on this, okay. Um, we have to model and also teach how to regulate our children's emotions. But that's a trip because we as adults, we don't always know how to regulate our emotions, right? That's why we need Jesus. <laughs> that's why we need the Lord. And as Christians, the foundation to that is God parents us as we parent our, our children, right? That's kind of what I'm talking about on Mother's Day, so I don't want to get ahead. Come back for that, though. Um, but regulation of your emotions does not mean, hear this, regulation of your emotions does not mean suppression of your emotions. It does not mean repression of your emotions. And too often in our lives, just maybe because of how we were raised, maybe our wiring, our culture, but even in the church culture, it's been taught, don't feel it all. And that's not God's heart. The church should be, and if you're new to the church, you're still, you know, I invite you to still receive from this message today, but I want to talk really quick for those of us who have been in the church for a long time. The church, any church in the world, um, a biblical church, should be the safest place to feel your emotions. But there have been times in history where that has not been the case. And our goal for today is to change that. Peter Scazzaro well, before I say that, actually, Pastor Ralph is going to be speaking in a few weeks on being led by the Spirit and not being led by our emotions. I stand by that message 110,000%. That is so important. Part of regulating your emotions is to identify what you're feeling and say, okay, it's okay to be mad. It's not okay to hit your brother, <laughs> okay, or if, you have, if you're having children. Or it's okay to be sad, but it's not okay to take that out on yourself or others around you, right? But the church could, and Pastor Ralph would agree with this, we just spoke on it, can take that to an unhealthy level and a swing the pendulum over here and say, well, if we can't be led by your emotions, all your emotions must be negative and must be not from God and must be sinful. And that is actually the opposite of God's heart. In fact, to deny your emotions is to deny how God created us. The Bible says when God said, let us, speaking of the Trinity, make man and woman in our image, it speaks of the whole person, that word image, the original word speaks of the whole person, your mind, your emotions, your physical body even, though we live in a fallen state. To deny any aspects of that is actually not biblical. That's actually Gnosticism, and it's actually Platoism, not Plato like the kind Noah's playing with. I mean Plato. <laughs> and yet we've let that theology creep in, if we're not careful, to our Christian thinking. And God wants to heal that today. Peter Scazzaro <laughs> wrote a, a book for Christian leaders concerning the, our emotions. And this is kind of wordy. It's a quote, but follow with me here. Sometimes when someone starts reading a quote, your brain turns off, but it's really good, so stick with me, okay? It says, spiritual maturity goes in tandem with emotional maturity, church. Where did we get the idea that spiritual maturity can be achieved apart from an integration of the emotional aspects of who we are? We have many people, hear this, who are passionate for God and his work, yet who remain disconnected from their emotions or the emotions of those around them. Hear this, this combination is deadly for the church. Stick with me, this last little section. In the minds of many today, the repression of feelings, we were just talking about that, the repression of feelings and emotions has been elevated to the status of spirit or virtue, denying anger, ignoring pain, skipping over depression, running from loneliness, avoiding confusing doubts, among other things, has become a way of working out our quote-unquote spiritual lives. Church, that is not how God intended it. Thank you. <laughs> that is not how God intended it. I know I'm kind of hitting you kind of hard here, but I'm doing this with so much love because I love you guys and I love our church. And I struggle with this stuff too. I don't necessarily, God's been so good and, and, and he, I don't believe that sadness, like I know this in other words, like I know that sadness is not unchristian or unbiblical, but I can still struggle even to this day with close friends and be like, can I share this? Am I allowed to share this something sad? Am I being a burden to them right now? Like I can still struggle with that. So please hear me when I'm up here talking, I'm not like yelling at you guys. I'm bringing us all to a place of, wow, something went a little wrong in church history and I want us to be the type of church that says, no, no, we're going to do it God's way. Amen. Dr. Henry Cloud, and this is in your notes. Well, it's about to be. It's <laughs> the end of this quote is in your notes. When we lose our ability to feel sad, church, we lose our tenderness. It is a major aspect of ourselves that must be protected. Say protected. 
protected at all costs. If we can't feel sad, we can become cold-hearted. And this is in your notes. Sadness does not equal weakness, rather processing. Say processing. Say that again, processing. Thank you. Processing sadness leads to strength. Processing sadness leads to strength. There's a visual in your notes that they're going to put up on the screen right now. And it says, oh, did they already do it? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, can we do it again? Thank you. Sadness does not equal weakness. Look at that for a second. Either on your sheet or right there on the screen. Look at that for a moment. Really stare at that simple little thing. And now take a quick inventory within yourself. And I'm, I've done this too all week, believe me. Have we bought into that lie that sadness equals weakness? And of course, the point of this visual is that it does not <laughs> equal weakness, right? Amen. What does God say concerning sadness? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. This is in your notes. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Someone say perfect. Now say in weakness. It doesn't say my strength is made perfect when you're acting really perfect. It doesn't say my strength is made perfect when you're acting super, super spiritual. <laughs> it says my strength, his strength, this is talking of the Lord, is made perfect in your weakness. On and on in that uh, chapter, Paul even says, therefore, I will boast all the more so in my weaknesses, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? The Bible says in Matthew 5, in your notes, blessed are those who mourn. Say blessed, for they shall be comforted. It doesn't say chastised are those who mourn. It doesn't say criticized are those who mourn. It says blessed. And hey, if you're in a place where you're like, hey, I, I, I agree with you, but I'm not in a place where I'm ready to like talk to people about some of the stuff going on in my life, that's okay. But I, can, I pray that no matter where you are, if you're super new to the Lord or if you've been walking with him for 110 years, that you know that before the Lord, it's the safest place and even the most important place to be vulnerable before the Lord. And to say, Lord, I, I might not be able to talk about this with, any, with anyone else yet, but I'm going to talk about this with you. And the Bible says, blessed are you when you do that. Because then he can actually get some work done in your life. <laughs> then he can actually start doing some healing. Blessed are you when you mourn, because then you will be comforted. Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I want to take a brief second, and I'm going to dive into how Jesus views us when we go through sadness. And there are probably a lot of us in this room right now who are going through something that is sad. And also, I want to just take a really quick pause. Today, I'm not specifically diving into the topic of depression, but that's such an important topic. And Pastor James did a phenomenal job um, a few weeks, how long ago was it now, <laughs> um, back in our mental uh, Renewed Mind series on mental health. I highly encourage you to go back and listen to that if you are struggling with depression specifically. We can have seasons of being depressed. Doesn't always mean we are struggling with depression. But if you are struggling with depression, Pastor James did such a good job of taking that stigma out of it and inviting us to, to get the help and the support that one would need and deserves when they're struggling with depression. So just know that if I'm talking about sadness and I'm not specifically diving into that, that's simply because Pastor James did a way better job at it than I ever could. And just know that I pray that this can also encourage you if you're someone, and there's many people who struggle with specifically depression. Does that make sense? So what are some practical things? Before we dive into what Jesus says about it, what are some practical things we can do when we are sad? Now, this might sound really elementary, but it's so important to remember. We have to allow ourselves to sit in it for a little bit. We have to allow ourselves to sit in it. Now, sitting does not mean living in it, right? If you're in a season where you're like, wow, it's just like this cloud's over my head and I'm kind of stuck in it, that's when we definitely want you to know God doesn't want you to have to stay there, right? But there are, we have lost our ability a, a Christian psychologist I listen to often says, we have lost our ability to sit in our sadness and to sit with the sadness of the person next to us. We've lost that. That's not okay. We have to sit in it for a second. And then we have to bring people into it when you're ready. We have to bring people into it. Isolation is a tool that's used by Satan. God did not design for us to do this life alone. In fact, our brains, I couldn't even get into this because there's so much more notes Jenny Allen, she just in recently wrote a book called Untangle Your Emotions. I'm yet to even read all of it, but so far it seems pretty sound. It's a Christian book. They found out scientifically your brain was not meant to process sadness alone. That God 
made our brains, you know? We were not designed to process sadness alone. We have to bring people into it. And Pastor James touched on this too, but sometimes there's just some practical things you can do. And I'm not trying to oversimplify it for anyone who's really going through it right now. But there are physical things we can do. Sometimes, do you ever just have like a really good workout? <laughs> You're like, man, that didn't fix everything going on in my life, but I feel a little better right now. <laughs> Don't look at that and say, well, that's just, that's over here. No, that's important. <laughs> Maybe it's not that for you. Maybe it is finding a specific friend. Maybe it's changing the way you eat a little bit. I'm working on that right now. <laughs> Pastor Jim did a wonderful job last week of talking about counseling and how it's so important sometimes. And we don't talk about it often in the church, but it's so important. When I was going through something, I was around 19 years old. I was already getting trained for ministry. And I had had, some of you know my life, my family story. We had gone through some pretty, some really dark um, loss and I just had never processed it. And I just realized, you know, I had, I was, I came here. I had a wonderful youth pastor and Annette and I had friends and I had a good family. But I still needed to talk to a professional about that. And that wasn't unbiblical of me. In fact, that was probably one of the top, top five best decisions I ever made in my life. Because I wasn't able to talk about it before then. And then now I can talk about that. If it's part of my testimony now. And I can talk about it to whomever might want to hear about that, you know. But if some of you might just need to know, you have the permission to do that. And at, uh, in your notes, and if you didn't grab them and you need this, please grab it before you leave. If you flip it over, at the very bottom, there's actually some resources. These are not the only resources, but it does say if you desire additional counseling in your life, the following options might be a help to you. If you go to Focus on the Family um, online, slash, you know, focusonthefamily.com slash counseling, they will set you up. They do a free consultation. They will set you up with a licensed Christian counselor. Um, or you can go to betterhelp.com. There's... Everywhere on the internet, there is a promo code for betterhelps.com. And you could go in there and find a Christian counselor. Um, Nate has done that, and he's loved it. Um, it's wonderful. I hope you feel encouraged today, um, just knowing that that's okay to do. <laughs> um, and what are some practical things we can say to someone who is struggling with sadness? Well, we got to sit in their pain with them for a little bit, <laughs> you know? We try not to fix it right away. I can be guilty of that. I'm, I like to fix. I like to be like, well, what can we do about it, you know? And sometimes you need that. I have friends in my life that if I'm going to them, I know they're going to say, all right, Gab, well, what are we going to do about that? And I need that, right? But before that, we need to say, I'm here with you in this. You say something so simple like, I'm so honored you shared that with me. I feel sad with you. Some of you might say, man, this is kind of like a simple, like, what are we doing? Listen, guys, this can set people free just by showing them the compassion and love of Jesus. I had someone recently, all they said to me, I don't even remember what we were talking about. And one of my friends, she said, oh, Gab, I'm so sad for you for that. And I said, oh, you, thank you, actually. And I felt actually a lot better. <laughs> See, sometimes I think we're afraid to say that because we think, well, I don't want to leave them in that sad place. I don't want to make it more negative. I don't want to pile more sadness on. Actually, that's validating, you know? So how does Jesus view us when we are sad? I have to jump ahead because there's so much to cover, but sometimes I forget. First service goes really fast. <laughs> what does Jesus say about our emotions? This is where I want to kind of hone in. If you're going through sadness today or you've had some sad stuff in your life and you realize you haven't really worked through certain things, just know that when the Lord puts his loving hand on your heart to say, hey, we're going to talk about this today, it's a safe, his arms are safe. You know, how does Jesus view us when we are sad? How does Jesus view you when you are sad? In order to, to find that out, we're going to go to John chapter 11. I'm going to be reading a few more scriptures than what's on your screen. But John chapter 11, it's a good chapter. I wish we can dive more into it. There's a lot of nuggets in it. But in John chapter 11, essentially, the crux of this is that uh, Lazarus has died. And Jesus loved Lazarus. And he had been dead at this time for four days. And Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. We see them a few times in scripture. And Jesus, it says in verse 20, So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, and hear this, I am the resurrection and the life. 
this verse was said yesterday at Marie Ford's service by one of her grandsons, I believe. And uh, it's beautiful. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I want to skip now to verse 32, and I believe this is what's on the screen for you. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her, say saw When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. Let's pause there for a moment. What is Jesus' view of you? What is Jesus' view of us when we are sad? When he says he saw her, did you know that there's over 40 times in the New Testament where it says that Jesus saw somebody? But I'm not saying saw like, oh, I saw that my phone was on the table here. I see it there. Not that. It's a Jesus noticed somebody. And it's almost always in tandem with Someone who's in distress. This particular word saw in this particular verse says to know and to consider and to understand. What is Jesus' view of you when you are sad? He sees you in your pain and he understands you. We didn't have to have a God who did that, but he does. He sees you. It says he saw her weeping. And the Jews who had come with her also weeping, back to verse 33. When he saw this, he was deeply moved, deeply moved. There are other instances in the Bible, it talks about Jesus' compassion for us. And when it talks about that, there's another passage when there's a widow whose husband had passed and her son died and said, when Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her. That word compassion, I heard this from a, a different pastor. That word compassion literally means, it's kind of intense, from the guts. It actually says from the bowels. That's a little intense, right? But Jesus had such compassion on this woman. He was like, oh. He saw her. It says he saw her and he had compassion on her. He saw where she was at and he felt for her. What is Jesus' view of us when we are sad? He sees us and he has compassion. He has compassion on us. Verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, it's in your notes and it's on the screen. It's so simple. Shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. And I don't know, if you've grown up in the church, if you went to Christian school, you kind of, well, we won't get into that. But basically, sadly, that church, that verse could become a joke sometimes. Where it's like, oh, Jesus wept. Simple, easy, done. Can that be our memory verse for the week? I don't know, you know. That's a powerful verse. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit ensured that that was in there because we need to know that the God of the universe, the God incarnate, Jesus wept for us. He weeps for you. Now, here's what I want you to really, really catch, guys. If you tune it back in, if you, if you might have tuned it out, I hope this ministers to you. You and I, the Bible says that we're the light of the world, but we're the light of the world because Jesus lives in us, right? We don't, we're not the answer, but we know the answer, amen? We carry the answer, right? But we in ourselves, we're not the answer. In fact, sometimes we make more of a mess of things, right? Jesus was literally the answer. He literally says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you know the passage, you know that Jesus ends up raising Lazarus from the dead, which is incredible. (laughs) We know that here on this earth, we don't always experience it in that way here on this side of heaven, right? The purpose of that is when he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life, he is speaking of the fact that though he did that for Lazarus there in that moment in the flesh, we can still latch on to this chapter in scripture because because of him, we have hope and life in him, amen? Because he is the resurrection and the life. But here's what I want us to catch really quick. Jesus was the literal answer, and he was even going to fix it in a very specific way that even you and I don't always get the opportunity to have, right? He knew he was going to do that. And yet, when Martha came to him, I don't, we don't know her exact tone, but I would not be upset at Martha if she was angry in that moment. She said, if you were here, my brother would be alive right now. And when Mary came, she's weeping at his feet. She's clearly distraught. She said, if you were here, my brother would not have died. What does Jesus do? He's the literal answer. He's about to fix it in front of their eyes. And what does he do? He doesn't say, all right, Martha, quit your anger. Quit your anger. 
All right, Mar Mary, up we go. Enough with the weeping. Enough. Don't you know I'm here? I'm coming in. I got it. I think Lazarus, come forth. He doesn't do that. He lets them feel it. He lets Martha be a little angry. We think she was angry. I can't pin that on her. Maybe when I get to heaven, she'll say, I wasn't angry. I don't know what she was. I'd be angry. Have you been angry when someone's passed? I've been angry. <laughs> I've been. I've been angry at God. He understood that. Okay? Jesus allowed them to feel it. And then not only that, he had compassion on them. And then he felt it. And then he stepped in and did his thing. <laughs> So what is Jesus' view, and this is where we're ending, of us when we are sad? He sees you, he has compassion on you, and he heals you. He heals you. I want to ask you a quick question. Why did Jesus come on this earth? Don't answer out loud, but just say in your mind, why did Jesus come? Why did he come? Many of you probably said to forgive us of our sins and die on the cross, right, so that we can have eternity with him. Absolutely. If you thought that, don't ever change that answer. That is the correct answer. D.L. Moody had an amazing sermon a long time ago, and he said, that is all true, but there's an additional reason. There's a few additional reasons. The Bible says in Luke, it's in your notes, this is Jesus talking, speaking of God the Father, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus did a lot of things on this earth, but there were a few reasons he was literally sent. He was sent to heal your broken heart. He was sent to heal my broken heart. He doesn't just see us. He doesn't just have compassion. He also heals us. And I want to just simply close with this today. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, in your notes. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Oh, I love that verse. There's so much. We can, we can do a whole sermon just on that verse. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I wrote out some next steps um, in, in our notes, and maybe if you're not really a note person, maybe grab it on the way out and just reflect on it during the week, perhaps. I actually did that with Pastor Jim's next steps last week for just concerning the anger. It was nice to have it during the week and just say, oh, how can I reflect on this, you know? There's, I'm not sure where you might be today. Maybe you're in a place where you're like, yeah, I am in a place of sadness. If that is you, you need to know the Lord loves you so much. He sees you. He has compassion on you. And he wants to heal you. He wants to heal you. And it starts with coming to him. All the practical stuff is so good. I like the practical stuff. I live by the practical stuff. But don't do the practical stuff apart from him. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? The Lord wants to heal you today. Maybe some of you, you're not in a sad place right now, but maybe because of this message, the Lord says, hey, maybe you were taught to repress your emotions a little bit. You were taught to suppress them. You were taught that you were a burden to so-and-so in your life. You're not a burden to Jesus. He might say, hey, remember that thing that happened kind of like me when, when I was talking, when I had to just go speak to somebody. God was like, hey, Gab, kind of knocked on my heart lovingly. Oh, that doesn't work. I was going to knock. <laughs> it worked a little. <laughs> Cammie's like, please don't do that, Gab. <laughs> Sorry for everyone's online if I just hurt your eardrums. <laughs> and God said, hey, Gab, we got to work on that today. I'm going to put my hand of love and compassion on your heart today. We're going to cover it. We're going we're gonna to face that now. I'm going to hold your hand through it. Maybe some of you, there's God saying, hey, we're going to work on that thing that we don't talk about now. We're going to start finding a counselor. We're going to talk to someone in this church. We're going to start doing some healthier things for us because we don't want to stay in that place, you know? And maybe some of you, you're doing great. <laughs> you're not in a place of sadness. And if that's true, praise God. I love that. But perhaps the Lord just wants to encourage and remind you, hey, but if someone around you is sad, what is our biblical view of that? And can you be there for them? I'm not talking about taking the weight of the world on your shoulders. I'm not talking about not having boundaries. That's a whole other sermon, which is so important. But just to love on a person. That's what the church needs to be. And I, I've seen our church do that. That's what our church has the capacity to do, is to be there for people who are broken. We have so many ministries who do such a beautiful job at it. And for those of you who are doing that, and you know this, and you yourself could have preached this. You're doing so good. And the Lord smiles when you have compassion on somebody. So just simply, just to end, if you just would be willing to bow your heads and close your eyes, 
just as you reflect on this topic today, what has the Lord maybe placed on your heart, if anything? And whatever that is, if you said, Lord, I've bought into the lie that sadness equals weakness, or Lord, I'm just simply a little brokenhearted and I just need your, your grace and your strength, or Lord, I just got to change my perspective on this a bit. Just know the Lord is here. He sees you. He has compassion on you, and he's here to heal you. And God, I just pray right now for any person who's in any of these categories that we've talked about today. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you love us. I thank you for your compassion because they never fail. I thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I ask for that healing comfort to begin today in the lives of people who are willing to just open up before you and say, Jesus, I need you. Thank you that you are faithful and you do not reject anyone who comes to you. We love you so much, Jesus. Thank you for your grace today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, church, I know it's kind of a somber message, but I do encourage you to speak to whomever you might need to speak to. We have prayer teams here who are willing to pray with you and talk with you and talk about what might next steps you might need to take. If you're new today or you just haven't been here in a while, we have a welcome room that's open right behind Eugene back there. Um, and uh, we have a gift for you. We'd be happy for you to go there. We'd be happy to meet with you and pray with you. Otherwise, we love you so much. And I know this could be a hard series, but I encourage you to continue to let the Lord speak to you because he's got stuff for us every single week with this. So love you, church. Have a great day.